Okay, we're live on Facebook. Are we? Yeah. What are we? I'm about to pull it up on my here on this <laughs> so I can see. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'll let you do the talking here. Good morning, everybody. Hope everyone is well today. Aurelia and I are not in our normal location. <laughs> we're um, we're down at the beach. It's my mom's birthday week, and she scheduled a thing, and here we are enjoying some beach time and having church from Padre. I'm turning um, that off because we just don't have enough internet. Yeah, no. Okay, I don't think that's gonna work. Okay, we're just gonna uh, so, trust and believe. Yeah. Trust and believe. Gratitude and trust, right? Um, so if we have some connectivity issues, somebody's got to let us know if we need to do change something. So somebody like go like this on the Zoom, please. Yes, so, so we, we, know. we are not in the chat today. <laughs> right, so we're trying to keep all the windows closed <laughs> so that all the Wi-Fi goes to this one purpose. So we um, need somebody we have... to like man the chat in Facebook world. Who wants, we deputize you all right now. So yes. Just like go nuts, go nuts in the comments. Yes, do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, just a few announcements today, y'all. Um, also, if you have not grabbed your communion elements, please get a bite and a sip for yourself. Um, but the big announcement, what was that, Matthew? What did you have? Oh, it's frosted mini wheat and some peach tea. Anybody else got anything cool? We got... I we have peanut butter pretzels with orange juice. Mm. I love peanut butter pretzels. Um, okay. No church on Sunday. This week is the first Sunday. So feed your soul Sunday. Do something that fills your soul. Do something that helps you rest. Do something that, um, that you've been wanting to do and putting it off. This is your moment on Sunday morning. Um, we love this ethos of affirming rest and affirming time off around here so it's feed your soul sunday this week um one week from today so there we will not be online having any services also we have a fun book group that's happening not tomorrow monday but monday a week from tomorrow mm -hmm. october 4th yes october, i think it's october 4th october 4th it's our thy queendom come right? yes so one of two meetings. Groups. Yes. So the first meeting is on the first half of the book and the second half, we'll discuss the second half. Um, but our friend Kendall Rothis wrote a wonderful new book that just came out and we are reading it together and having some fun discussions. So that's happening soon. Um, if you are interested in our metamorphosis cohort, which we're really excited about, me, Aurelia and Matthew over there, <laughs> Um, we are writing this kind of a curriculum for this course for folks who um, want some spiritual companionship on the kind of faith deconstruction renovation journey. And we are very, very excited about this thing. So if you want to be in on that, you've got to fill out an application. And there are kind of some, um, there's some stuff in there you'll want to read. So hopefully we're going to link to the application in the comments, someone someone who just who has facebook open <laughs> has enough internet to also do that uh, this is the worst being disconnected from the comments or my favorite part <laughs> no okay so metamorphosis but the application for the cohort is due on thursday the september 30th so we'd love to have your application and there's some questions for you to answer um, get on our email list if you want to know what's happening, what is going down at Peace of Christ Church. You need to be on our email list. So if you are not, you should either drop us a DM, send an email, put in the comments. I mean, you probably don't want to like put your email address in the comments, but let us know so we can get you on the email list because that is the way to be in the know. Yes, and our contact information is in the guide every week. Yep. by the way, just scroll down. You can email someone. 
um, guide, the link to guide is being put into the comments. Matthew has given us a thumbs up. And so the guide is going to be linked in the comments there. And we are very, very happy this morning, just last but not least, we are very happy this morning to welcome Nate and Eleanor. Um, Eleanor is going to sing for us and Nate is going to read. We are giving them <laughs> big love and big welcome. Yes, they are two kiddos who weren't able to um, be in on the kid-led service last week, but because for various reasons. And so we're welcoming them to help us today. Yay! Yay! Okay. Yes, and of course, kids are always welcome to lead elements, but yep. they were just planned for last week and had to end up missing out. So we're excited they're making up what they had prepared. And um, thanks, Fran, for, mm -hmm. for the welcome. I'm going to chime us in now. Um, so I invite you to use this as an opportunity for grounding if you've had a chaotic week, um, if, you know, you've had a chaotic morning. This is your chance to take some breaths, set an intention for yourself and enter into this sacred space that we have decided is sacred together. So I'm gonna chime 10 times to mark the hour. And thanks for being here. Good morning, kiddos. I'm doing the kids' sermon today. So if you're a kid, come on up to the screen. We'll have a quick little kids' sermon. I'm going to be talking a little bit about, well, have you ever done a self-portrait? I bet some of you've had to do a self-portrait for school. Here's um, Eve's that she did a while back. It sometimes can be a little bit awkward to draw yourself. She didn't, I asked her to do one this morning, a fresh new one, she did not want to. But, um, she, you know, sometimes it's kind of weird. You have to like put your features and you have to figure out yourself and put it on a paper and it kind of feels a little awkward. And this book has other stuff about her, like it's got her favorite season or it's got her favorite animal, um, all the things about her, her favorite sport. So these are things we think about when we think of who we are sometimes, right? What, what do you like to do? What are some fun things you like to do? Now, what if, what if we didn't do a self-portrait like this, but we did a spiritual self-portrait. What would that look like? Hmm, I'm thinking. I wonder what would God say about us? I bet God would remind us about all the things that we are. Number one, we belong to God. We are his children. God made us. We were made in God's image, like we like to say in Imago Dei. Um, we also have talents that God gave us. Um, and we also reflect God by things we do. So we're going to talk a little bit about those things even more. So let's say you do something for someone, or let's say someone drop something walking by and you pick it up and you give it to them. That's just a small kind gesture. And that can reflect God. That can reflect serving God, being kind, being thoughtful of others. Um, or what sometimes let's say someone, you know, is sad or someone fell on the playground and they're crying that you sitting with that person who's feeling upset can also reflect God. 
Um, or if you know someone who is really encouraging and you have that friend that always cheers you on and says, you got this, you can do it. That is also reflection of God. So here's how God describes us. God says, I love you just the way you are. And God wants to be with us all the time. And Jesus loves us and lives inside of us. So um, let's see what other abilities. Let's think about other talents. Like if you had to make a list of spiritual talents, there's, there's God given talents that we have. And yesterday, well, actually last week at church, we got to see the kids singing. That is sharing your talents. Um, and we're going to get to hear a child singing today. And people have all sorts of different talents. Sometimes they're hard to see. Sometimes they're easy to see. Sometimes it's like, oh, you're great at sports. And that's really easy to see. But sometimes they're on the inside. Um, you can be compassionate. Uh, my son, Echo, is really compassionate. If he knows someone has been sick, he is always bringing them up and always asking how they're doing because he was sick for a long time and he knows that is not fun to be sick. And so that is a talent now, that's a gift that he has compassion and he's using his own past experiences to bless others now. Um, yesterday, when we had the children over for a fun event at my house, um, Shay was there and she was talking to Haddon for a little bit when Haddon came to drop off Ellis and she was telling Haddon what a fabulous job he did on his children's sermon last week. And I noticed the same thing. Haddon is a really good listener and he makes people feel important and special and welcome. And he was letting the kids share during a sermon and he was still doing a sermon and reflecting and responding to the kids. He did a really good job at that. And that is using God. That is a reflecting God. Haddon reflects God when he is being a good listener. Um, so if we made a book kind of like this and it, you could write all about yourself, maybe I'll create one for the kids. Um, we could do it together, but you, it would say, God made me and you could draw yourself. And then you could talk about who you are on the inside and say, I belong to God and my talents are, and then you could say, I reflect God by these things. So I hope that this week you can think about ways that you reflect God. What, what is it that you do that reflects God? And how do you see God in others? If you think of one of your favorite people, I bet you can think and know why that person is so special to you. What makes it, makes that person, makes you drawn to that person? And I bet it's a characteristic that God has. So remember, God is in you. You belong to God. You were made in God's image, and we can reflect and shine God. So I hope we think about our spiritual self-portrait this week. I'm going to pray. God, thank you for creating us. Thank you for loving us just the way we are. Thank you that Jesus showed us how to live. Please help us reflect you, God, and see you and those around us. Amen. Oops, I'm muted. Thanks, Naomi. I love the idea of a spiritual self-portrait um, for kids and grown-ups to work on. Um, speaking of that, <laughs> so I uh, invite you into our communion space in this moment. Hang on, let me make sure that I'm on the correct speaker view. I really went, <laughs> and I don't know how to fix it. Am I on speaker view? Is it looking like I am? I am, okay. Um, so I got a really good question this week. Uh, thank you to the person who asked. Um, that was, what is the lectionary? You guys keep saying the word lectionary and we don't know what that is necessarily because you wouldn't, especially if you didn't come from a liturgical tradition that followed the lectionary, you might be like, what the heck? And we never want to use any kind of like insider language. So thought I would just 
give devote a minute or two to um, explaining what that is. So the lectionary, we generally follow the revised common lectionary, which is a, a, it's a prescription, a prescribed series of readings for each week that covers, that goes over the course of three years. And so we're currently in year B, there's year A, B and C, we're currently in year B, we're wrapping up year B because at Advent, the church calendar um, begins again in Advent. So in Ad, when we begin Advent, which is the Sunday after Thanksgiving, we will be in Advent week one, and that will be commence year C, which is our schedule of readings. So the lectionary covers the high points of the scriptures, the texts, doesn't cover every single, um, every single section, but the highlights for sure, you get a good, you get a pretty good idea of what's in there. So this week, um, our schedule of readings includes Mark 9, and it also includes the Numbers 11 that Aurelia is going to be preaching for later, from later, and it also includes the reading that Nate's going to read here in a bit. So I, um, I wanted to focus on Mark, the Mark 9, which is our gospel reading for today, Sunday, uh, which is today is proper 21 of ordinary time from the Revised Common Lectionary from Mark 9. And just to preface that, um, I wanna say any more on my personal spiritual journey, I've come to understand good spirituality as, um, and good spirituality by which I mean spirituality that fosters positive change in the world or bears good fruit as both Christ and St. Paul refer to it in the text. Um, at various places is having this, okay, good spirituality has this particular hallmark. This is my observation. Um, that is that it invites and supports the letting go of ego. Um, I tend to think of ego personally as the small mind, the, um, the survival mind, and we absolutely need ego. I am not demeaning or condemning ego. Ego, ego is absolutely an essential part of our, of our hu humanity, our makeup as human beings. And I'm very grateful for well-managed egos in the world that create safety and human survival. But a runaway ego, a not managed human ego, a greedy, defensive human ego, a hierarchical ego, is I would say behind most of the systemic problems that we see in our society today. I think if you dig, dig down, you'll find human egos run amok. And Jesus is not about letting human egos run amok. So I just want to point our attention to this text in Mark from Mark 9. This is verses 38 through 50. I'm going to kind of skim it for us. So John said to Jesus, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, don't stop him, for no one who does a deed in power in my name will be able to soon afterwards speak evil of me. Whoever's not against us is for us. For truly, I tell you, whoever gives a cup of water to drink, gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ, will by no means lose the reward. If any of you, and here's where he starts to get real and a little bit harsh, you might think, if any of you Put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me. It would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. Ouch, Jesus. Then he says, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life, enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell. And then he says, and if your foot causes you to stumble, it's better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and create more hell on earth. I'm paraphrasing there, yeah. He goes on and on about this. It's kind of harsh. And I tend to think, okay, knowing Jesus, how I've ever experienced him, I tend to think that Jesus doesn't actually want us to gouge out our eyes or cut our hands off. I think that Jesus is um, pretty much a nonviolent guy. And I think he's using a rhetorical device here, which is something we all do. We all humans, we're using the rhetorical devices all the time. And um, we're exaggerating and we're, use, we're using metaphor. And I tend to think that this is what this is. Um, but it sounds harsh. 
And I think he's saying something important about ego here. That is, it's better to let go of the ego than to allow the ego to create more hell on earth. So here we are right now at our metaphorical communion table. I got an apple and some coffee. I don't know what you got, which is always right at the center of our gatherings that we create at peace because it's like the, it's like the highlight, it's the main event, it's what we're here to do because of communion's power to ground us in good spirituality that creates transformation and fosters positive change by helping us let go of ego, helping us transcend ego and pull our attention away from it because here at the table you guys there's no hierarchy there are no clicks no one's better than another we're not putting stumbling blocks in front of anyone and no one is more worthy or more welcome everyone is just here at, at on this level playing field of kingdom community at the communion table that's what we're doing here it's why we're we emphasize it so heavily around here because communion undermines ego in such a beautiful and powerful way. So today, as we take a bite and a sip, we remind ourselves of this level of playing field that is the kingdom of heaven, that is where the last shall be first and the first shall be last, and that what we're doing is the, this collective work of decoupling ourselves from ego and doing good spirituality instead. So, uh -oh, I think I join me in the liturgy of communion. The Lord be with you. And you say, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God, for it is right to give our thanks and praise. And now we take a bite and a sip as a symbol of us all being at this collective table where we're letting go of ego and hierarchy. Yeah. And so God, as we do this collective work of letting go of ego, we ask that this communion table in our sacred community that we're building here would strengthen us for the good work. Yes, great is the mystery of faith, that Christ has died and Christ has risen and Christ is coming again, amen. I wanna extend now a very warm welcome to Eleanor who is gonna sing for us with the help of her dad, Ross, you're in for another treat.
Oh my gosh. Thank you, Ross and Eleanor. Um, you, you and all of our young ones are just one of the biggest treasures in our community. And I can't imagine belonging to a community that doesn't have young people singing about lives being put back together and looking toward our God to do that. So thank you. Um, you're a gift to us, Eleanor. You truly are. I want to uh, welcome Deborah and Nate, some other gifts in our community for this time of a deeper look. Hey, hey, you guys. I can't hear you, sorry. Hello, hi. There, now I can, barely, a little bit. Maybe they can hear better on Facebook. Um, Aurelia mouths something to me, but I can't tell what it is. So we'll just press on. They're just talking quiet. <laughs> oh, they're talking quietly. Okay. Sorry. So, hey, um, how are you guys this morning? We're good. 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 So uh, this is our deeper look time, as you know, where we get the chance just to just to know somebody in our community better. If I remember correctly, and I'm not known as a person who remembers things, uh, but Deborah, I did we? I think we met doing going through the the David gushy book together his his book on inclusion of the lgbtq community in the life of the church is that where we met that's where we kind of got to know you a little bit more um we actually joined what was it um it was one of your books that were studies with david and joyce Sorry. oh right 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 dave yes yeah it was, that uh, was that was our very first exposure to y'all, and you, Aurelia, and Fran were kind of alternating meeting that, so that's where we officially met, but um, yeah, we got to know you. I got to know you a little bit more doing the David Geshe study. Got it. Um, if you could do me a favor and just maybe move closer to the mic, because even Zoom isn't switching the frame over to you when you're speaking. Um, Is this better? <laughs> yes, 10 times okay. better. Thank you. Okay, thank you. good. Okay. Um, so just uh, tell us, tell the community about yourself, please. Okay. All right. <laughs> so my name is Deborah. Um, I am with my wonderful husband, Joel, and we have two kids, Nate and Sophia. Um, I am the third child of seven children. So big family, which big family things. Uh, we were all homeschooled from start to finish, so that was kind of my upbringing. It was very, we were really, really evangelical, really conservative, and the whole spiel. Um, we all had, you know, it was a thing where we had our own trends in the, the homeschool community, one of which was denim jumpers, and so there was a time when everybody Everybody had denim jumpers, all the girls anyway, and the boys wore their jeans. Um, so that was, that was fun. Um, since there were seven of us and um, we're, my family is very musical. We, we love music. My dad, I think he originally wanted us to become a bluegrass band altogether. And so we, um, we all had our own instruments and we never quite got to band level. Um, but we had a lot of fun playing instruments together and singing bluegrass songs and different uh, fun hymns that I look back on and I go, wow, those were weird words. Okay. <laughs> um, but I love, I do love music, but one of my biggest passions growing up was actually ballet. I took ballet lessons from the age of eight to 17 and just, I, I still really love it. I actually tried to get back into it. Um, this last, actually last August, I got back into it as an adult, which is, <laughs> it's a lot harder jumping into ballet after you've been off for, you know, 10 years. And then in May of this year, I actually broke my foot. And so I, I had to kind of put that on hold for a while. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was not fun. That was not fun. Um, but I still love ballet. It's still very much a part of me and I hope to get back into it at some point. Um, so like I said, we were very 
um, conservative and we were in a not just homeschooled and conservative, but we were in a fundamentalist church where um, it was kind of, ex it was an unspoken rule that girls were supposed to be, you know, the homemakers and that was their job. And so I never considered it really anything else. Like that was, those are my goals um, to become married. And I, I was so concerned at the age of 16. Well, what if I don't get married until I'm, I don't know, 30, it's going to be horrible. <laughs> but um, turns out I got married at 18 to my now amazing husband, Joel. We were, we were really, really, really young, but it's okay. Um, so married at 18, we had Nate when I was 19. And then after having Nate, we we're like, okay, wait a minute. This whole kid thing is a little bit different than we thought it was going to be. So waited a little bit longer to have Sophia. Um, and now we're quite content with our two wonderful children. Uh, let's see. I, so even though I thought that, you know, being a mom was the ultimate, um, highest calling for a woman. Uh, I still have, I still had a lot of interests. And once Joel and I had gotten married and we had Nate, we decided that the church that we were in, no, please, no, please. we decided the church that we were in was not the right place to be very much so. And so we got out of there and I was able to explore a lot more of my passions, which I have a lot. <laughs> I, I, I kind of like to say I am a Jack or Jacqueline of all trades, um, expert in none. But that's okay because I have a lot of experience and a lot of stuff and I'm trying to embrace that part of my personality. It can be, it can be hard because I, I look at other people and I go, well, they, they focused on something and now they're this amazing thing. And I'm like, I never really focused on something, but I've had a lot of experiences. So I explored interior design. I became an interior designer for a while. Um, I became a manager at a boutique. That was fun for a while until I decided management is not for me. Um, then I taught, I went through a course where I learned medical transcription so I could um, transcribe, you know, doctor's orders and such. That's not for me, <laughs> for sure. Um, then I became a makeup artist. I really enjoyed makeup. I worked with photographers and models and did some weddings. And I really did have a good time with that. I thought that was going to be my thing that I would focus on more, but actually, no, it's not. I now... Like I still, I still enjoy makeup, but um, it's not something that I want to pursue as a passion anymore. I'm actually kind of sick of it to be perfectly, perfectly honest. Um, but I've explored like graphic design, web design. I do some social media stuff for somebody now. And so just, just a lot of stuff that I've explored. And my newest goal in life is to become a physical therapist assistant. Um, so that's going to be a longer journey, but that's my that's where I'm headed right now. So yeah, I like lots of things and I have all sorts of things planned. Like I want to learn how to sing properly. I want to learn how to play harp. I want to go, you know, climbing mount on mountains. So I'm just, I have a lot of interests. It's crazy. I love it. I love it all. You just, you just seem so free. Like you've just been freed now yeah. to, to become who you are. Mm -hmm. I love it. it you, you, you made me think of that parable Jesus told where he's like, the kingdom of God is a massive tree that all the birds of the air come and find a home in and nourishment and things like that. And like, but previously somehow that church you were at, it, it was like a cage, not a tree where you found safety and nourishment and you could fly away if you needed to fly away, you know? So I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad to hear this trajectory for you. Um, what is something unique or quirky about you that we wouldn't know unless you just let us in on it? Um, this was, you definitely wouldn't know unless I told you, um, I'm ambidextrous. So technically I'm left-handed. I write better with my left hand. I do things a lot better with my left hand, except for throwing stuff. I can't throw very well with my left hand. So I throw with my right hand. And this was really a big problem for me growing up because I didn't have a strong sense of direction. <laughs> Um, and there were like even small things, like I would sit down at the table to eat and I would suddenly forget, wait a minute, which utensil goes in which hand, which one do I prefer? Um, and the biggest issue was when I was learning to drive. <laughs> so my mom told me once, you know, get in the, the right lane, um, you know, as I'm learning, so I'm not really aware of what's going on. She told me get in the right lane. Well, I thought she said left, or I thought I was getting in the right lane. I don't know. 
but I accidentally pulled out in front of this giant truck that was coming along. He was not happy. We didn't end up in a wreck, which is great, but I just, the whole concept of direction, like, it's, it's, you know, the specific right, left was really, really difficult for me. Um, over time, I've gotten better, especially as I've driven, you know, a lot more and I've given like Joel and I have, when we go on trips, like I, I navigate for him. And so it's like, okay, now I know, but for a while there, it was rough. It was rough not having a strong dominant thing, but it's, it's actually really helpful, honestly, to be ambidextrous. I've done, been able to work, like if I'm doing, you know, decorating around the house, if I'm painting, I can't, I, I can work with both hands, which is it's helpful for me, but yeah, it wouldn't be, I don't think people would notice that unless I told them. So. I love it. I love it. It's a little scary to hear the driving stories, but I love <laughs> it. It's better now. Um, bonus question that you weren't anticipating. If you could be any superhero or heroine, who would that be? Black Widow count as a superhero? She's like one of the best. Are you kidding yeah. me? Okay. Well, I mean, she doesn't have super powers like Wonder Woman or whatever, but I'm like, no, I'd be Black Widow. She's smart, she's funny, and she knows how to kick ass. So <laughs> you don't have to have superpowers to be superheroes. There you go. There you go. I love it. And I 100 percent agree. She's amazing. And she's so complex and lots of heart. Um, thirdly, or I guess fourthly. What are you most excited about in your spiritual journey these days? Um, I'm kind of excited to continue unlearning. Unlearning a lot of what I had previously been force fed. And I'm, I'm still figuring out where I'm going to land spiritually which is kind of, at first it was scary to not know, because I've known for so long what to believe, who to be, what to do. Um, so being able to have the space to unlearn and relearn, on the one hand, it's exciting, but it's also daunting. <laughs> um, because I have to, I have to make the effort to do that, to relearn. And it's so much easier just to, to get caught up in the day-to-day -day stuff. But I really, I really am excited to continue to learn. And um, I forgot to mention on getting to know me a little bit more, doing our study on um, the LGBTQ community actually revealed to me that I'm bi. And so this is not a spiritual thing, but it kind of is because it's very much tied to who I am. And I'm excited to explore that. Not that it, it's not going to change. At least I don't, I don't think it will change my marriage because I am happily married to my best friend and soulmate. Um, but it's just being able to recognize <sighs> there's so much more to me than just being a wife and mom and exploring my emotions and my personality is also, I think, spiritual in a sense for me. It might not be for everyone, but for me it is because I suddenly have the freedom to really explore um, deeper into me. And, and I think along those lines, I'll be, I'll find my Imago Day, which I'll talk about a lot. And I'm like, I, I want that. And so I am excited to unlearn and learn about me and about the creator as, as they are meant to be for me. So, yeah. <laughs> I love, I love all of that. And truly it's an honor to be a part of a community where, where we get to journey alongside one another on that, on that journey of unlearning and relearning. And if we do nothing else as a community, just that in and of itself is priceless and invaluable and, and you can't get that in other places. So thank you for taking this unlearning relearning journey with us. I'm glad you're here. Okay. I will pass it off to our next element for the service, but this was has been wonderful, Deborah and Nate. Thank you. This is Nate. You want to tell me your name, Nate? Hi, I'm Nate, and I'm 10 years old. 
Let me just speed up a little bit so they can hear you. Let me turn it off. Um, I read it from James 5, 13 through 16. Go ahead, Nick. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. In the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. We hear the voice of God through these words. Thanks be to God. Thank you for reading, Nate. And Deborah, thank you so much for, for sharing. It's good to see all three of you this morning. Okay, let me get situated here because I was like so intently listening that I don't feel ready now. <laughs> so I'm, re I'm recording. I'm going to record on my phone just in case we have some connection issues here. And I want to read to you our one of our lectionary readings, which is from Numbers. So what that means is I need you to like, like really just get yourself prepared to listen. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's numbers. Okay. This is like, this is kind of dense stuff. Okay. So I'm going to read from numbers. This is from the lectionary. I, I, I don't remember all the verses because they like picked certain ones, but you can look in the guide to see the exact reference. And I am reading from the, um, the inclusive the inclusive Bible today. Soon the riffraff among them started complaining and whining and Israelites said, who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish we used to eat freely in Egypt and the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But out here, we're wasting away. There's nothing here but manna for us to look at. Moses heard the people, family after family, wailing at the entrance of their tent, so much so that Yahweh's anger flared up again. Moses was aggrieved and said to God, why do you treat me this way? Are you so displeased with me that you must burden me with this whole nation? Was it I who conceived these people? Was it I who gave birth to them that you should say to me, carry them at your, at your bosom like a nurse with a baby at the breast to the land that I swore to give to their ancestors? Where am I to find meat to give these people? When they come to me weeping and saying, give us meat to eat, I cannot carry this nation alone. The weight is too much for me. If this is how you will deal with me, just allow me this one favor and kill me now. <laughs> Spare me from seeing such misery as this. Yahweh said to Moses, gather 70 of your elders, those who you know to be leaders and officials among the people, have them come to the tent of meeting and take their place there with you. So Moses went and told the people what God had said. He gathered 70 elders and had them surround the tent. Yahweh came down in a cloud and spoke to Moses, taking some of the spirit that was in Moses God bestowed it on the 70 elders whom Moses had gathered there. And as the spirit came to rest on them, they were seized with prophesying and did not stop. Now, two other elders, one named Eldad and the other Medad, were not in the gathering, but had stayed behind in the camp. They had been summoned to the tent, but they had not gone. Yet the spirit came to rest on them also, and they prophesied in the camp. When a youth came running to tell Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp, Joshua, who from youth had been Moses' aide, cried, Moses, stop them. But Moses answered, are you jealous for my sake? If only all of God's people were prophets, if only Yahweh would bestow the spirit on them all, then Moses returned to the camp with the elders. We hear the voice of God in these words. <laughs> Okay, so 
two years out of slavery in Egypt, the people asked from their desert place, how will we be nourished in this wasteland you call freedom? And it makes me wonder if you have ever missed the full belly of certainty that you had in your bondage. <laughs> back when you were bound to faith paradigms of shame or fear or guilt, back when throwing those shackles on others were second nature for you, have you ever missed the sweet fruit of stability and easy answers and belonging? Even if you were to say to me, no, never, whether you mean that or not, I wouldn't believe you. I wouldn't believe it was that easy for you to leave it all behind. Because like those Israelites fleeing Egypt with an army behind them, like those people of God wandering across a desert when they were guaranteed a promised land, we have encountered the hard truth as well, that liberation has its costs. If we didn't know before, we know now that freedom doesn't come without a struggle. We know there's too much loss in deconstructing our faith to not ever once grieve what was. And so as we think about what it means to be the post-church church, I want to acknowledge an unfortunate marker of it, which is that there is no such thing as the post-church church without people who are battle wounded. Wounded people make up all our churches, let's get real, but a post-church church is truly willing to make space for all of us and all our wounds, even though it's the trickier way and even when it interrupts or causes discomfort. In the post-church church, we are not sweeping things under the rug. We are naming our individual and collective traumas aloud here. We are making space for the grief and the fullness of our wounds. And we are prior prioritizing an image of God and spiritual practices that are concerned with wellness. We are not interested in staying sick around here. In the post-church church, the medicine works. So the post-church church is a place where healing is sought, and we, Peace of Christ Church, are over here seeking some healing. We wouldn't be here otherwise. We need sacred community because there is no way around the inevitable muck of this work but through, and there's no way through but together. The prophet Moses knew this much. He led an entire people out of slavery. And now this man who had dealt with imposter syndrome his whole life was suddenly a political leader, a spiritual leader, CEO, and army commander. Every bit of power and burden rested on his shoulders. And from this place, Moses buckled under the pressure and he cried out to God and said, literally, verse 14, I cannot carry this nation alone. The weight is too much for me. And y'all, we are creating a community that's built on the same cry. We are crying out that hierarchy is not sustainable here as well. Maybe the church used to function as a top-down place where one spiritual leader told everyone how to proceed, but the post-church church is not interested in top-down theology. We are laying bare our struggles. We are showing our whole hand. We are walking in clarity and transparency. In the post-church church, we know collaboration is key. We can see on the other side of things that hierarchy wasn't all it was cracked up to be. And we are wise enough to know we don't want it anyway because we've been through too much. And not just with our own faiths coming undone, but with the reality of what it means to exist in these times. It's one pile on after another. And when we cry out to God, like Moses, we're pissed. We've thrown out our prayer journals with the nice little pretty lists. And we are pissed. Like Moses, it is all too much. The weight of the world is too heavy. The burden of suffering is too great to shoulder alone. We need help in the form of each other. And so perhaps the message to us is the same as it was in our ancient text. Moses wanted out. Moses was like, kill me now. I can't take this, kill me. And God's like, okay, I hear you. But God didn't lift the burden off of him. And the people's realities didn't 
suddenly ease up or change. Instead, the solution offered was the addition of community in the work, the acknowledgement that Moses shouldn't have to go it alone. And we can't either, not the best of us, not the least of us by divine design, we cannot face the realities of this world alone. We need sacred community because we need help navigating life. And the way of Christ is teaching us how to be. We need sacred community to help equip us with the practices and tools of depth that will ground us amidst all the upheaval and chaos. We need sacred community so that together we can move into an authentic faith posture. And so that we can help our kids do the same because it is authenticity that will ground us and hold us. The post-church church is not interested in any other type of faith, but an honest one. If it means irreverence, so be it. If it means breaking with tradition, so be it. If it means leaving some things behind, so be it. The post-church church is an authentic church. It is a church who is willing to shift away from what's been done, away from the sway of power, away from the typical standards of success or endless ego tendencies. It's a church who is constantly willing to say over and over again, aha, there's a better way, and then has the guts to actually live into whatever that vision is. What other people or Christians or churches have to say about it be damned. A post-church church consistently and radically reimagines a way of being that's reflective of heaven on earth. And I believe that we are trying our best to lean into authenticity right here at peace, right here in our tiny but mighty community. And amidst so much gloom, this knowledge gives me hope. Gone are the days of silent suffering, of holding our traumas hostage in our bodies. Gone are the days of stifling our intuition. We are asking questions out loud. We're embracing mystery. We're celebrating doubt. We're opening up. We're sharing our struggles. And we are retiring comparison and jealousy and isolation in the process. We are putting it all on the table. We are saying it all out loud and we're doing it in community. The more we travel this road together side by side, the more we realize community begets authenticity and authenticity begets community. This is the birthplace of resilience. If a church isn't actively promoting authentic faith journeying, it may be a church, but let me tell you, it's not a post-church church. Because remember, the post-church church is full of wounded people. And we need a place to tend to our wounds, not deny them. I have so much to say about the post-church church. I even wrote down four pages of it in preparation for this sermon, but then I tucked those four pages away for a different sermon because I kept coming back to this starting point, authenticity, as our groundwork and our foundation for working and moving and living together in a way that's sustainable and healthy. This is what it means to thrive. And thriving is the stuff of salvation, which is new life, which is getting free. And here's the thing. When we're living into authenticity, not only does it heal us and hold us, but it also compels us, meaning we do good work in the world. Consistent authenticity is the stuff resistance is made of. Because absolutely, under no circumstance, circumstances can we be dishonest. We absolutely cannot be untrue. We cannot compromise what is good and right and of God. In other words, when we're leaning into authenticity, try as we might, we cannot not be prophetic. And I don't know much about Eldad or Maydad in our text today, but I know I like them. I like them precisely because they didn't do what they were told. They were summoned, but for whatever reason, they didn't come. They didn't follow the other 68. The text says the spirit came to rest on them also, and they prophesied in the camp. These two stayed with the grumbling, suffering, however you want to look at them, grieving people, and there they prophesied. So at the start of this story, we have one prophet. By the middle, we have 70, and by the end, the whole nation is in proximity to spirit. Something compelled them to break with what they'd been told, 
So they were disobedient and they went against what everyone was doing and they resisted. And in a great show of authenticity, the two rogue prophets chose to radically remain in the camp where they were not supposed to be. They chose to radically remain authentic to whatever value system was driving them to make that choice. Our posture is authenticity too. And the post-church church can choose to radically remain in that posture. It is a posture of confession that beyond the concepts of dogma and prescriptions and obedience, there is an even more honest way. It is a posture of acknowledgement of divine presence shared with all of us via spirit in us. It is an open-handed posture, an entry point into the full embrace of Imago Dei. Imago Dei tells us that we were made in the image of God, spirit in us, and we don't have to live in paradigms that perpetuate shame or fear or guilt to usher us into divine connection. We don't need that kind of motivation around here. The truth is we're all bad Christians. We're all bad meditators. We all suck at meditation. We're all bad activists. We're all bad at getting stuff done sometimes, yet we're good. Good, 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 created in God's image, good. It's the ultimate paradox, but we don't have to wrestle over it anymore. We can just let it be true. We can stop feeling guilty and stupid about it. We can focus on a posture of authenticity instead, honesty at all costs. This will increase our self-love and our self-compassion, and it will expand our capacity for extending that same love and compassion onto the rest of creation. From this place, we become more prone to movement because finally, we don't need that movement to be perfect. We just need it to happen. If the post-church church had one characteristic as its starting point, if it had one attribute to hold on to consistently, and if that attribute was an utmost concern with individual and collective authenticity, just imagine, we wouldn't even need a post-church church. The church would have just gotten it right the first time. Maybe church would be a safe place for all people instead of an insider's club where we have to hang our smiles and questions at the door with our jackets. As it is, here we are. We are a church who has accepted the reality of these post-church times. And I really believe that the only reason I have anything to say on this matter at all is because I've just been learning it from you people all this time about what it really means to be a post-church church. In so many ways, we are already living into what this means. And our commitment to authenticity continues to energize us, propelling us into that work of liberation, that resurrection work, that new life work. Remember, we know now that liberation comes at great cost. No one ever said liberation was easy and certainly not God, not once. I'm not saying that there's a way to ease the work or lighten our loads. All I'm saying is we need each other and thank God we have each other. May we open our eyes a bit wider to the truth of this, to the hope of it, to the great divine provision within it. May we continue being bad Christians and bad meditators and bad activists together. It may be mediocre, but at least it's real, at least it's honest, and at least it's authentic. Amen. Okay, I'll be uh, I'll be reading the litany. Um, I'll read the um, light print. Uh, everyone reads the bold print. Can you all hear me? Okay. God, we are getting real with you, admitting our weaknesses, our needs, our discouragements, our problems, our exhaustion. We aren't hiding our truth from you. We are done pretending we are fine when we aren't. We are done fibbing about our capacities. 
We are done overextending ourselves. We are done making excuses for injustice, and we are done making light of trauma. Like Esther, we seek help when we are desperate. Like Moses, we admit when we are exhausted. Like the psalmist, we cry out for rescue. Like Christ, we know we need to face what hurts. In turn, you greet us with radical acceptance and honesty. You graciously make space for our needs. Our help is in you who made heaven and earth. You revive our souls. Don't let us get ensnared by insolent and ego-driven people, nor let us become those people. Help us to humbly and resolutely face what troubles us, whether it's inside ourselves or in society. We toss out everything that causes harm to the vulnerable, and we get rid of everything that keeps us from being our true selves. We give thanks for the unpretentious way of Christ and for the welcome of God that meets us wherever we are. Amen. Amen. And thank you, Clark. Thank you, everybody, for contributing to this service today and contributing to our community in the incredible ways that you do. I want to send you with a blessing, which is what benediction means. So you, you know this benediction. Please join in with me as we go. Lord, you are ascending God. You sent your word to create. You sent Christ to reveal. You sent your spirit to empower. You sent your church to proclaim. Send us, O oh God, to renew the earth. Lead us by your spirit and your word. As your people, we now go by our love will make you known. People of God, you are sent. Go in peace for peace. Amen.